All right, it is 9.30, so good morning, everyone, and welcome to Prague. Um, this is IETF 118, and this is the Content Delivery Networks Interconnection Working Group. So if that's where you intend to be, then you're in the right place. Uh, my name is Sanjay Mishra, and I'm joined here with my co-chair, Kevin Ma. Um, hey, so, and good morning, and very early good morning to some of the folks, and probably good afternoon some folks that are um, in a different time zone on the near the east of the sun. All right, so um, we get started here. Uh, let's see. Note well, uh, this is a reminder of IETF policies that are in effect on topics such as patents and code, uh, code of conduct. Uh, please familiarize yourself. Um, this is just a link towards where you can uh, read yourself. Um, please make sure that you follow the um, IETF policies. And as a reminder, by participating in the IETF, you do agree to follow the IETF processes and policies. Um, and make sure that you, you read through um, everything that is here. Um, and then uh, note very well as well, um, that the ITF meetings and virtual meetings and mailing lists are intended for professional collaboration and, and networking as defined in the ITF guidelines for code of conduct, ITF anti-harassment policy, and also the anti-harassment anti procedures, which are documented in RFC 7776. If you have any concerns about beha observed behavior, please talk to the ombuds team who are available here in the ITF or via the email. Uh, just, uh, I guess, a couple of set of reminders. Um, moving on, uh, these are the tips for those that are in person and also those that are remote. So I think everybody that needed to be on is at least on. So these instructions are sort of really not as useful when you're already in the meeting. So I'm going to skip these. And the agenda is available on, um, on the link that you see there along with the chair slides and any, any other slides that participants have provided. And then look, let's look at the uh, working group milestones. Kevin, you want to walk through these or shall I walk these through? Um, sure, you can go ahead. All right, so, so we've got uh, some of the working group drafts that are coming close to a point where we think we can uh, have them submitted to the IESG. And we're looking at, um, in fact, one of the first drafts that you see there is already um, has been submitted to the IESG in the working group last call. After the working group last call, uh, CDNI extensions for HTTPS ACME star. So that's already, uh, and we've received comments on uh, from the reviewers. And then there are a couple of other drafts that we think um, should be ready, and we're targeting to have them uh, go into the um, Summit for specification that is um, in December. So we one is the capacity extension, and the second one is the um, the HTTPS TLS subsert delegation. So these two um, are on the docket today also, but we're hoping that these might be ready for um, submitting to the IESG. And then outside of that, we are targeting um, one document in February of 2024 which is the um, RFC 8007 BIS. Uh, it's been open for quite a while and it, there's been a lot of work there as well. So the, uh, the target is February, 2024 for that uh, specification. And then leading on in December, 2024, we've got the three working group drafts. Um, we're targeting December. Um, and of course these can be sooner, um, but that's, that's what the chairs are expecting that we, we should be able to finish and wrap these up. Uh, and that includes the edge control metadata, uh, the cache control metadata, and the protected secrets metadata. And that basically is a set of working group documents as of now. And then if nothing else that gets added into the working group drafts, then we, um, in April 2025, make a, we make a decision about uh, rechartering or dissolving the working group. All right, with that said, um, here's the uh, proposed agenda we have today. Um, number one, I do want to ask if there are any minute takers uh, that can volunteer. The session is recorded. We just want to make sure that uh, the important uh, points
points discussed are recorded. So if there's anyone, any volunteer, please let me know. Please let us know. I can um, do it someday. Thank you, Kevin. Um, so here's, here's what we have today. Um, we've got uh, six drafts that are currently active working group drafts. So we're going to cover those. Um, approximately 50 minutes, we have uh, allocated time for that. And then we've got uh, three other documents that have been submitted but are not yet working group drafts. So we're going to um, go through these uh, today. Um, and not going through the list here, but uh, as you can see in the list, um, six and plus three documents. And then we have open mic, about 20 minutes. Um, we've got a couple of uh, agenda items there um, that Alan will be talking about, uh, cash management as well as uh, named footprint. Um, so we'll cover those and then uh, we'll wrap up the session. Um, any agenda bashing? All right, hearing none, um, I've got one more item before we move on. So there was an, an errata submitted against RFC 8006. Uh, Kazuki uh, had submitted this uh, and he has made uh, some corrections into how the original um, RFC 8006 uh, dealt with the, um, with the windows, the, with the time windows. So he has separated out the windows and, and the uh, action from the two. And um, uh, from the chair's standpoint, we, we think this is the, the correct uh, correction that has been made. Um, but now that we have uh, our area director here, just wanted to take your uh, input as well, if you have any objections or any, any view. Excuse me. This was just a correction of the example. The actual text in the document describing the object is unchanged, correct? Correct. That's correct. Okay. Yeah. Right. So, uh, hi, Francesca here. So, um, the question is, is this uh, uh, to mark verify or hold for document update? I don't know if you... I think, can we just mark that? it verified? I don't think we were going to do an update just to correct the example. Uh, yeah. Um, it's more like how important is this um, errata for people implementing this if it's like usually a hold for document update means this is um uh, something editorial or some typo or something like that that is not like fundamental you know and then it doesn't mean that there needs to be an update to the document it's more like yes this is correct but um you know not fundamental for implementers yes it's it's not um i mean it's a it's a typo in the example. The, as Glenn mentioned, the actual text of how they implement is correct. Um, so we don't think it's, you know, that yeah. big a deal. Okay, so maybe I will just uh, mark it hold for document update. Um, I also wanted to mention another thing about um, ACME document or yeah, the one that has passed ISG evaluation and it's, um, it's waiting on me um, to, do the final approval. And I was just waiting on the authors to take the comments from the ISG and submit a new version uh, before I did that. So that's why it's it's waiting. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I did discuss with, uh, with Fred and um, he thought he had responded to some of the emails, but uh, I don't see those at all. So- No, me neither, so maybe- Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I just had that conversation with him last night that check the emails and make sure that uh, the uh, there have at least been five reviewers that have sent their comments, including you. So um, yeah, that that the the author owes response to each of those. Right. Okay. And so I don't. I I'm not sure yet if there needs to be a revision of the document or not. Yes, there there will be revision. Um, it's it's mostly uh, editorial nits, uh, really. Uh, so uh, yeah. So, yeah. Okay. So I will just mark it that there is going to be a revision, and then after that's done, I can approve and, and move to publication. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so with that, uh, let's move on to the first item on the agenda. And uh, let's see, pick up the next deck here.
Ben, do you have a hand raised? Um, I, I'm first on the agenda, I believe. So oh, okay. I was clicking the slide share button, but it doesn't appear to actually do anything other than put my hand up. <laughs> so I figured it would let, let me take control of the slides, but that doesn't appear to be how it works. Um, I can do that, but, uh, let me, so I, I have your slides up, um, and I can, I can drive. Okay. Um, well, uh, if you could flip to the first slide, please. All right. Um, so capacity capability advertisement ex uh, extensions, also known as capacity insights. The whole point of uh, this draft, for those of you who uh, aren't familiar, is to provide a feedback mechanism from the down uh, from the downstream to the upstream um, to allow the upstream to make traffic delegation decisions. So. The uh, downstream CDN can communicate limits in a number of different terms, such as egress bits per second, um, uh, requests per second, uh, also storage counts, things like that, that allows the upstream to decide uh, how much traffic to send to the downstream. Uh, alongside the limits, there's also telemetry, which can provide real-time feedback on how much traffic the downstream is seeing. Um, so we're not really going to go into the, the details of the draft here because uh, it's been part of the working group for quite a while now and it's a mature document. Um, so this is just a high level summary. If we can go to the next slide, please. All right. Um, so we adopted this draft last year. Uh, there is a, a new revision, which I put, put up for this IETF after feedback from both Kevin and Sanjay. Um, I think it's in a really good place. I did notice uh, just tonight a typo in the document. So there's definitely going to be at least one more revision. And I'm sure other people will catch some other things with the document. But as far as the, the text itself, I think it's, it's pretty mature and, and ready to go. At least that's my opinion. Um, so uh, I guess I'm just asking the, the group here what the next steps are. Are we ready for our last call? or does anyone have anything major they want to do with this draft before we do that? So I, I guess that's I think, an open. Yeah, so, so Ben, I think the, the document looks uh, in a fairly good shape um, from what I read. And, um, you know, I, it looks like pretty, uh, pretty well written and, and um, between uh, the IETF 117 uh, Kevin had a couple of comments, which you've already addressed. Um, so I think that the document looks in good shape to me. Uh, I apologize. I haven't had a chance to look at the updated draft. I assume you addressed everything. The one open question was about the IANA registry. Did we decide yay or nay on that? Um, I don't have a strong opinion, but I remember that was the question from last time. Um, I think it was it was split in that we were going to do registry for some of the things, but not all of them. Um, okay. And that you added in the latest version? Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll have to go back to the text. Okay. My apologies. I must, it's also 3.30 in the morning here. So. <laughs> hey, I know. Um, um, okay. Uh, yeah. I, I'll take another look at it. But otherwise, yeah, I think the, the draft was in pretty good shape other than that. Okay. Yeah, sorry. I can't answer that question off the top of my head right now. No worries. We'll, we'll take that offline. Assuming it's good, um, unless anyone has any objections, I think we're probably ready for our last call. Okay. All, all right. right. I think that's all you have, Ben, right? Yes. Um, well, I, I guess uh, my question, what, what's the procedure for we do a vote on the mailing list or how does that work? Yeah. We will send out a, a last call notice on the mailing list and, um, and take it from there. Right. Okay. Thanks, Ben. Well, that's it for this slide deck, Ben. All right. So let's move on to the delegated credentials. <laughs> OK. Hello. Can Thank you hear me? Uh, yes. Right. OK. So um, an update on the delegated credential draft. Uh, can you go to the next slide? So just to recap on the scope, so the 
uh, draft specifies how to use uh, delegated credentials and defines two objects, one MI, one FCI, uh, and uh, well, describe how to use them uh, in, in, in CDNI. Uh, so there's an error on the slide. So it's not a draft anymore, the uh, subset delegated credential, it's an RFC. Uh, and um, yeah, so they have two objects defined. Uh, next slide. So the, mm, the biggest update since last meeting is uh, that there was a pre-review from uh, SecDeer. And so they pointed out that there's, um, so there's an optional property where you can, uh, um, where the um, upstream CDN can provide a private key to the downstream CDN. And the uh, reviewer said that it should not, or it cannot be in clear text. Um, and so he proposed two ways of addressing that. And um, so after a few exchanges with him, we uh, came to this uh, proposal, which is now in the new draft, where we uh, specify that if the private key property is used, uh, then it must be encrypted using um, some uh, Jose JWE envelope. And uh, the encryption key can be announced in the uh, FCI delegated credential objects. So doing so, the um, well, the private key will never uh, um, go in clear text over the wire. And um, well, and I think this addresses the review from from Secti. So next slide. And just as a recap, so that on those two objects that are defined in the draft, so we have the FCI delegated credential where you can. The downstream CDN announces how many delegated uh, credential it supports, uh, and it can provide this uh, private encryption key. Uh, it's an optional uh, property. And then in the MI delegated credential objects, it's basically an array of delegated credential with this optional private key, which has been uh, encrypted using the uh, key provided in, in the FCI object. And that's it, basically. And um, yeah, and so the question is, is, are we ready for our working group last call? So um, I'll jump in here. Um, I did a review of the draft yesterday. So I think um, principally you, it looks like the, the uh, security review that um, you received. And I see that you have added those changes and I know you have also offline communicated um, with the security reviewer. And uh, so just make sure that you also do that on the uh, mailing list and make sure that the changes that you have made um, are sufficient you know, from the security review point of view. Um, outside of that, I reviewed the draft and um, the changes you have made in terms of the uh, uh, ensuring that there's the uh, encryption that looks fine. And I've, I've got uh, several comments, but they are, they are all editorial um, for most purposes. I have a couple of clarifying questions also, which uh, we can just look into the uh, mailing list. You can respond to those in the mailing list um, because I just sent those uh, late yesterday. Um, but I think overall the, the draft is looking, um, once you have... Um, you know, updated the draft with, with the comments. I think it's it's looking good uh, to move forward. Okay. I know Kevin has to review as well. I agree. Um, I, I think it's I think the the new text looks okay. It would be good to have Mike just confirm that on the list. Um, if we could send a ping to him, and then um, otherwise, I think it's in pretty good shape once we address Sanjay's comments. Okay. Okay, so I will um, ping Mike on the list. I will uh, address your comments, uh, Sanjay, and uh, we'll do a new version with the all the units uh, corrected. Great, and then I think we're probably ready for last call. Thanks, Christoph. Thank you. All right, let's move to the next draft here. All right, um, let's
let's see if I can uh, go to the mic and make sure I can uh, flip the chart as well. So I'm going to present this for Nir. He is not in the meeting today, um, unfortunately. So I will give a quick update. Chair is moving. So let's see here. All right. Um, so this. So right now we have version nine that is out. Um, and um, we did a quick succession, succession of six, seven, and eight, uh, then from eight to nine. And really the, the big difference between um, version nine now and version eight uh, is that um, uh, we got some comments from IANA. And um, so version eight to nine really only reflects uh, comments that we got from IANA. And they were mostly uh, clarification type of things and, and making sure that uh, the, the wording is correct so that IANA is not confused about uh, what is the actual text of the document versus what we are asking IANA to do, um, as well as we had some erroneous references uh, that got fixed. Um, for example, we were pointing to RFC 8007 where it should be to the new RFC. So we changed the text uh, in section 6.2.6.1. Uh, there was one change. And then uh, there was a bulk change in sections 11.2 through 11.7. Um, and that again, we, we had picked up the language from the original 8007, which talked about um, adding the sub-registry within the registry. And uh, Ayanna pointed, pointed out to us that we should really not be using that and then uh, updated that to uh, have the registry uh, added into the registry group. So that was really the difference. And, um, and you can also, and then there were a bunch of nits in the document editorial type of changes that we did. Um, and that if you wanted to see just what changed, you can uh, just look at the diff of the two files. Okay, and then more comments from IANA. So on version nine, we got some more comments. Um, and uh, this is again, uh, this has to just do with uh, how we have uh, used the text. So the text could be confusing as to what IANA needs to do versus uh, the things that are just part of the text, but not, not tied to having IANA do any action. So um, particularly on section 11.2 of version nine, um, we use that uh, we are, the definitions being repeated, but what is really meant is that um, we're, we're using the trigger action as a trigger spec and we're taking the, but we're not changing the meaning of the thing. So that's what was being meant. Um, but the way it came out, the text was confusing uh, and that confused IANA. So what we need to do is make sure that we delineate the, what is required of IANA versus what, what is the text. So um, I've given an example here uh, of how we will go ahead and change the text there. Okay, and then there's uh, another issue from IANA was that, um, and this is, I, I wanna also uh, ask the, uh, the group here as well as to how we should handle it. Um, basically, IANA is saying that in some cases we have defined uh, altogether almost all new registry, except there was one case where we, we did not. So the question is that we, we should either say that, we should call out that all references to A007 has been updated except for this one, or, or we update all the references uh, in the new document. Um, and and I, uh, we can go either way, but I wanted to see if there's any preference, should we go one way or the other? Kevin, do you have any thoughts on that? I'm sorry. Um, oh. So basically on the, the issue number two that IANA has is that on the payload types, um, we have not updated that in the version nine. So either we, we say that the payload types remain the same as they are in RFC 8007, or we basically um, use the new RFC number that we would have uh, and bring the payload types in the new RFC. I think the existing payload types 
are already registered to 8007, the new payload types, the V2 payload types, should be registered in this one using this RFC, right? Is that yeah. the question? Yeah. OK. Yes, I think the new one should be regist registered with the new RFC. Yeah, I think that, that sounds like um, what we should do, and um, we'll just uh, uh, clean that up. And did I lose the connection? Kevin, um, Kevin, do you want to take uh, take care of the slides? I'll I have to reconnect. Looks like I lost the connection on the network. Uh, sure. And when I get back to the desk, I'll I'll reconnect. Um, I don't know if I can. Okay, hold on a second there. <laughs> It still is working. So, um, and then the the last issue is that um, again with sub registry there are we corrected that in version eight, but there are two other references where we have sub registries, uh, particularly in sections eleven point two and eleven point seven. So, um, all that is required is to basically remove the sub registry and just say that the registries are being created in this registry group. So that's just a minor change. So after the IANA um, changes are done, what else is outstanding? So there are, uh, I see there are three things that are still outstanding. One is um, um, there's been uh, email exchange back and forth with Alan about uh, things that he's looking to do in, in cash management. And, and there are uh, options that he wants to extend within the uh, current 8007 BIS. So we'll, we'll just uh, work with Alan to get that sorted out. Uh, and so that's one. Um, and the second is, uh, Kevin, you get a review yesterday on uh, version 9, so a lot of comments there. So uh, we just need to fix those uh, comments. Um, uh, and then uh, the, any other nits that we find throughout the document, fix those. So, so I think my, my sense is that uh, by sometime early to mid-December, we should have a version 10 out. Um, having um, worked with Alan on what needs to be added, and then incorporating all your comments, Kevin, um, as well as any other nits. So by mid-December, I think we should be we should be able to come out with a clean version. Um, and if everything goes well, then maybe we can um, uh, have the working group last call. And I think that's all I have here on my slides. So Sanjay, I think, yeah, I, I think the draft looks pretty good. I did a full review. I didn't do a full review. I didn't go over the IANA section and the examples, thinking those may change. We, we can go over those again at the end. Um, I think the big question is Alan's comments and whether those are going to make significant changes. The doc is already a, a large doc. And so if we can handle those as extensions um, in, in a separate that's probably easier, but if, if there are fundamental changes, yeah, we need to make sure that we get those into the base protocol. Yeah, yeah. So we, we just need to have uh, set up some working session with Alan over the coming weeks and then uh, sort it out. OK. Thank you, Sanjay. Thank you. All right, with that, uh, let's go through the metadata model. Uh, we've got three documents uh, that are working group draft, and then um, we'll transition over to, after those three, we'll transition over to the uh, new set of drafts that have come in. Um, so I think, Ben, you're first. Yep. Um, so this, yeah, th this deck is going to cover five different drafts. Um, three of them have been adopted by this working group. Uh, two of them are brand new, and we'll go through each of them in turn. So you'll be able to hear about the details for each of these drafts. Um, go to the next slide. So I'm going to start off by talking about protected secrets metadata. So the purpose of this document is to allow uh, the advertisement and the MI interface to embed 
secret values that uh, need to be encrypted so they're not in plain text transmitted with the rest of the configuration. This can be used for things like encryption keys um, and credentials. So we'll see an example of that uh, later when I present the deck about the logging draft that was recently submitted. Um, I have a slide there with an example of the MI secret value object. Um, so this, this draft got a great review um, from Kevin. So I addressed a whole lot of that feedback. There's a detailed reply on the mailing list addressing each of those items. Um, the document has been largely cleaned up and brought in compliance with those nets. We still want to do some sequence diagrams in the document to make the workflow a bit clearer because um, the, the plain textual description can be somewhat confusing. Uh, and then there's still the open question of whether or not to keep the FCI objects, those uh, the, the capability objects that merely wrap the MI objects. So Kevin raised the point that they seem redundant. There's nothing in the spec that prohibits using an MI object as a capability type. But I couldn't find any prior examples of that use. So it's not prohibited, but it's also not used anywhere, as far as I'm aware, unless someone can point out a place where it's used. So I'm not against it. I just want everyone to be aware before we do this that it's without precedent. So I agree. I don't think we did it anywhere else because when the original specs were written, you know, it was all already pre-laid out. Um, uh, I don't see any reason why we shouldn't. Uh, it's just an opaque identifier as far as things mm -hmm. are concerned. Um, I, I agree. You know, we did use FCI dot and MI dot, but um, uh, I'm fine with it. I'd rather not have the redundancy. I don't know if anyone else has strong feelings. Yeah, I, just I, I, I agree with you. Um, so the, like, the reason I drafted it with the FCI objects was just to kind of follow the form of other capability types. Yeah. But your point uh, is quite valid. And you're right, the, the objects are redundant. Does anyone have any thoughts? If not, I would say, go for it, Ben. Okay. Well, yeah, then I'll, I will, uh, I'll eliminate those in the next draft then. Glenn says in the chat, I think the FCI wrapper actually makes it clear. Huh? Okay. Well, maybe this needs some debate. <laughs> just one opinion. But... Uh, maybe we should take it to the mailing list. Yeah, um, I think. I think separate that out into a separate email because the, the response with all the other comments is really yeah, big. Yeah, it is quite large. Yeah. 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 Okay. And yeah, I'll, I'll do that. And, uh, and anyone who has thoughts, we can, we can keep a thread on the mailing list about it. Alrighty. Uh, I think that's it for protected secrets metadata, unless there are any other questions about this draft. Thanks, Ben. I'm going to come up next. Next slide. OK, so uh, cache control metadata. Um, this document's been kicking around for a while, certainly within the SVTA working group. And um, it's now you know, adopted by the working group here. Um, it got a lot of, also a lot of feedback from Kevin. So thank you very much for that. Uh, we've addressed uh, all of Kevin's feedback. And that is, again, in a uh, detailed uh, response on the mailing list. Um, just to refresh everybody's memory, uh, the key objects introduced here are objects really for the downstream CDN to uh, alter uh, the cache policies coming out of a upstream CDN and to drive its internal and external caching rules for how it passes headers through, um, and also ability to uh, bypass caching and to set some policies about how to deal with stale content and how to deal with um, errors when they come out of the origin and how you should uh, cache or not cache uh, when you do get errors out of an origin. Uh, some of the significant changes uh, from uh, uh, Kevin, really clarification of a lot of the definitions of the internal and external policies, 
uh, particularly the as is policy, which basically says that a downstream CDN um, needs to keep the essence of the caching rules coming out of an origin, but it need not express them using the exact same HTTP, HTTP headers. There's many combinations of HTTP caching headers that effectively say the same thing using just slightly different semantics. Um, and we clarified that in the document. We also, on the stale content cache policy, there was a bit of a of, um, ponging back and forth between the words revalidate and refresh. I believe we, we kind of zeroed in on, on, um, on one of those. And we did a little bit of renaming to make it clear uh, one of the properties that the failed revalidation delta seconds is the new name. And that really is meant as a back off. So if a, if a upstream CDN, if, excuse me, if a downstream CDN is trying to revalidate an upstream CDN and gets errors, it'll back off for a period of time before it goes back and tries again. Um, the document's been reorganized quite a bit to get all the examples in one place and to have minimal examples with each MI object added the IANA considerations, which call out the MI objects that are specified, fixed some links, cleaned up references. So um, we believe this document is ready to go. And although I didn't put it in the slide, we'd like to see if this document is also ready for a working group last call. That's it. Thanks, Glenn. Uh, I I apologize. I didn't get a chance to read the updated draft. I did see the, the email and that you guys addressed it. So I'm looking forward to taking a look, but um, I think otherwise, yeah, we can, we can see how, how the current draft looks. Uh, I encourage everyone to go in, and read it and, and, you know, post their own comments to the list and then, yeah, we can take it from there. Good. Agree. Um, I will also review these three sets of documents. I think we're ready to move on to the next one, which I believe is Alfonso. Thanks, Glenn. Uh, hello, good day, everybody. Um, yeah, this um, edge control metadata that was adopted by the group um, since uh, IDF 117. Um, and then, similar to uh, the other folks, um, first of all, thanks to Kevin Ma for the review of the draft that we presented. Uh, he he got a, a bunch of comments. Uh, um, I will try to address all of them in the version that was submitted um, as a working group uh, document uh, for this uh, meeting. Um, I try to add here um, the significant change uh, after Kevin Ma's comments um, that, uh, that could be relevant. Um, but I ask, please, everybody to take a look to the draft and please make as much as comment as you can. Uh, so from Kevin's comment, um, well, first of all, I just uh, align that this um, this uh, document uh, defines a list of um, configuration metadata objects that are um, meant for controlling edge access uh, to resources uh, in, in a downstream CDM mainly. So the, um, an upstream CDN is able to configure how uh, it wants the downstream CDN to behave so for some requests. Uh, without contacting uh, to the um, upstream CDN. And there is uh, some objects uh, regarding how the downstream CDN should manage the connection to the user that is making the request. Uh, so from the comments from Kevin, um, I can add that from one of the objects that is a MI cross origin policy that is uh, uh, used for uh, configuring how the downstream CDN should manage the headers, response headers relative to cores. Um, there was some uh, doubt about one of the property names that was called uh, apply to all methods. Um, after some discussion uh, with um, uh, uh, in the working open catching working group um, on this uh, aspect, um, we have decided to make a, a change, not just changing or renaming the property, but um, changing the, the sense of the default uh, behavior that is expected for this uh, MI cross origin policy object, um, where uh, in the previous version, um, it was supposed that 
it will apply only to options methods, HTTP options methods, um, and it was required this uh, apply to all methods properties set to true uh, to be uh, applied to every HTTP method. Uh, but uh, we decided that it was a consensus that is uh, it was a better behavior where by default the course default response headers were generated by the downstream CDN for all the methods and change this to pre-flight only uh, property where an upstream CDN wants this uh, behavior to be applied only to options, HTTP methods. Um, so yes, not just renaming, but uh, changing the default behavior. Uh, that seems to be uh, a consensus that could be more suitable for uh, upstream and downstream CDN's uh, behavior in, in, the, in the productions environments. Um, other change um, was related to the um, uh, sub-object that is the access control allow origin. It has a property called allow list that was defined previously an MI pattern match, but uh, as Kevin uh, pointed in his comments, um, really uh, the definition of this uh, property uh, was not a specific uh, pattern match based on just path, but it's including um, uh, uh, it's a string that includes an HTTP schema plus the domain name. Um, so it was not matching the real definition of MI pattern match. So we changed the definition of the allow list to reflect what is really meant for um, and to define how it should be constructed and remove this uh, reference to MI pattern match. Um, other changes in the document is that we have reorganized the examples. Um, we have uh, put, as uh, Kevin comments, uh, a separate section for the Microsoft in policy examples. So it doesn't uh, seem in the document that only um, are for the sub-object AMI access control origin. So we have a, a separate section for that. And we have other, uh, added a new informatic sample sections uh, because the, we, we included in the draft version um, some examples based on AMI processing stages. That is something that is still not uh, an adopted working group document. Uh, but uh, we refer that to the SBTA documentation as um, is the why we did this is because these kind of examples where you uh, select um, some filter or how to uh, define the uh, MI um, uh, allow compress um, object uh, for specific objects um, that could be done using AMI processing stages. So while this is still uh, not um, a working uh, group document, we refer that uh, an informative examples and linked to the SVTA documents. Um, I uh, ask, uh, sorry, I answered some questions uh, from Kevin about the uh, mandatory to send or um, uh, safe to distribute um, uh, on some of the objects that I hope sometime uh, Kevin is, is able to, to, to read it and to see if he agrees or not. Um, or we're going to open that discussion if you want in the mailing list. And we fixed um, the IANA considerations. Uh, we review all of the links and link to the SBTA documents where were necessary, um, cleaning up the normative and informative references. Also, we changed the version of the uh, XML to RFC to version 3. Um, so mostly, mostly is this. Um, as in the previous, uh, I think that maybe we can finish the discussion in the middle at least looking for a uh, last call uh, for in this group. Thanks, Alfonso. I, I haven't had a chance to review this one. I have all three of them on my reading list. Um, yeah, yeah. So I will take a look at the MTS STD uh, question and, and respond on the list. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Alfonso. Yeah, Will's going to go up next. OK, so these, so I guess that the next three documents that we have here are submitted as individual um, drafts. So go ahead, um, Will. Don't hear you yet.
Will, are you muted? Will, we are not able to hear you. Uh, I'll say that I did have an issue with Meet Echo randomly resetting my input device um, partway through the session, and I had to go to the preferences to reset it. And you can do that by clicking on uh, the button that's next to the leave room button on the bottom right of the bar. Yeah, Will is texting me out of band. I think he um, is having trouble with the mic. So I think I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and speak to this one. Yeah, we'll go ahead and do that. One second. There's a loud keyboard yeah. noise here. Oh, sorry, that was me. I'll refrain from that. OK, yeah, so I'll go ahead and take this. And uh, Will will just uh, chime in on the chat if he's got anything. Um, yeah, so Will and I worked on this together, although this is mostly his work. So um, this is work that we had, uh, going back a couple of years now, we had presented a large uh, draft with a whole pile of um, metadata objects coming out of SVTA work. Since then, we've carved it up into pieces. As you've been seeing, this is now the piece that is uh, only focusing on this expression language, MEL, metadata expression language. Um, and the expression language uh, really serves a couple of purposes. It's to define expressions used for matching. Uh, these expressions always just return a Boolean. The typical use case for these, as you'll see in the examples, is really to often to match against an HTTP header value or a query param to determine if you know metadata such as caching rules should be applied. Um, the other use case is what we're calling a value expression, and that would be used to dynamically construct a value that might be used to say um, create or synthesize a response header or a dynamic response maybe pasting together a few elements of, a, of, a, of, a, of the request um, to synthesize some new response header, for example. This is not a full Turing machine. This is not a programming language. It's a very simple expression language for these matches and values. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so this is uh, just this comes out of the uh, document just to sort of show the richness of what we've done here. Um, the key variables here are rec and resp, which very common for the request and response. And this shows how in the expression language, you can access the request URI, the path, extract a particular query parameter from the path, um, all the typical things one would expect in, in you know, web server, HTTP request and response uh, processing. There is a, uh, set of built-in functions as well that you can put in these expressions to do string matching, uh, regular expression matching, replacing, et cetera, uh, pulling a query param out. That may be a very common thing in CDN world, actually, or open caching world, is to extract a query parameter when you're making a cache key, uh, things to this uh, effect. Uh, pulling particular elements out of a path is often very common. Maybe you have to pull one of the elements out of a path to use that as part of a cache key or, or uh, some other rule. Uh, access controls may be driven off of this, for example. Next slide, please. Yeah, here's a few ex examples of these expressions um, and some of them in context of some of the other work we've done. So just in the upper left here, a very simple match expression to match on a request and just a, you know sort of a synthetic example here of matching on the user agent and the referrer, um, if you had that combination of matching is true, then maybe you could do something like accept or reject the response, the request, for example. This is in the lower left here is an expression used in the con in the in the um, along with uh, uh, computing a cache key. This is from the cache control document, the one we reviewed earlier. So you can dynamically set a cache key in this very simple example 
making it the, just a forced lowercase of the request URI. Um, many, in many cases, um, CDNs and open caching systems need to create a synthetic key based on some aspect of the request. So this is how you can do it. And then here's a value expression, and we'll see more of this in the next section in the context of processing stages um, where um, we want to do what we're calling a, re a response transform and we want to add a header. So here's a value expression that concatenates a few elements from the request, in this case, the user agent and the host. A uh, bit of a contrived example, but it just illustrates the kinds of things one can do. Next slide. So yeah, there is error handling here for both compile time and runtime errors. Compile time errors generally would be caught at the moment a configuration um, is provided to a, uh, you know, to a downstream, uh, to an upstream CDN. Uh, this would be in CDNI world, this would be, you know, as part of using the MI interface uh, to get metadata. Um, and typical examples of, of compilers might be using an unknown variable name or an unknown operator, incorrect number of arguments to a function, that sort of a thing. And then at runtime, these errors can happen as well. Um, you know, failure to allocate memory, um, any sort of error like this, and and we just called out in the stand in the spec that that should result in a 500 error being returned. Next, yeah. So we also have defined a uh, fairly fine grained FCI object to go with this it's called FCI supported MEL features that can be returned in an FCI capability advertisement for a given footprint, just like any other FCI object, and in there you can define specifically which MEL uh, keywords, operators, variables, and built-in functions one supports. So you could choose to support just a subset of the standard. Next. Yep, so I'll pause there. Um, um, yeah, so th again, this work th on the expression language has gone through uh, many rounds of, uh, of feedback and extension within the SVTA working group. And we now would like to call for that being uh, adopted as a CDNI working group draft. So I'll pause there before we go to the next one. Hi, Glenn. Um, I have a couple questions. I guess one is, I, I apologize, I haven't read the draft. Is the draft just for the FCI object or is the draft for the expression language itself? Oh, it has both. So the draft d defines the expression language it defines one MI object that goes with it, an MI object to allow you to set a variable from the metadata. And there's one FCI object, which is that the the um, the capabilities. We thought it was it was a, a, a useful to define them all together in one okay. in one document. Okay, and then I guess my other question, that my follow up is, the FCI object I understand is certainly within our scope. This the metadata expression language itself does not seem CDNI specific, um, and I don't know if is this something that should be you know HTTP working group or um, it's it's more HTTP specific, less CDNI specific from from my you know cursory read of it, and I don't know if anyone else has any thoughts on that. Um, I see Chris going to the mic, uh, and I'll pause there. Chris. Chris, <clears throat> Chris Lemons, Comcast. So it's not entirely um, generic. Uh, it is not CDN specific, but it is in a very real way intermediary specific. Um, and I think that the tie to the intermediariness might make this a more interested um, invested and excited group of people to perform the work. Um, I'll let the question of whether it's in the charter to perform the work be other for other people, but um, work gets done where there's excitement. And because this is tied to being an intermediary on the internet, um, it's pretty integral to the concept of being a CDN. Thanks, Chris. Um... Yes, you knew where I was going with the, with the question, uh, whether it fits in our charter or not. Um, Sanjay and I 
we probably need to have a discussion with Francesca about that, and maybe we just need to modify the charter. But um, if if uh, folks think that this is an interesting thing, I don't know if also you know we should take it to dispatch or some other group and shop around the idea, whether that makes sense. Um, I don't know if Francesca is still in the room or if she has a thought. Okay, I see her going to the mic. Hello, yeah, just to say I don't have any additional thought. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, that, that was my question. I, I, I do think it's interesting. Um, I think, you know, if, if this is the right place to do it, then, then um, that's okay with me. Yeah, I, I see the point you're making, and, and yeah, I, th I think it, it warrants further discussion. And just, we, I didn't put it in the slides here, but we also did include in the draft a BNF there for the language. Okay, uh, I see Sanjay is in the queue. Sanjay. Yeah, so so I think um, I agree with you, Kevin, and I think we just need to uh, take a look at the draft, and and if if it seems like the the motivation for uh, expression is is more driven by the CDNI then maybe it might be a fit here and that's what we we just need to take a look at it and and if it seems like the expression language the name but but really in in principle what if they're defining uh, actions um, or commands that uh, CDNs would uh, make use of then you know uh, that might be a fit here but I, I don't know yet. Um, I see Yov is next in the uh, queue. Yes. Uh, so uh, my take on this is that uh, yeah, it might be uh, the language more uh, fairly generic. Uh, however, for the use case of uh, CDNI, this is something that is uh, is is required. We can attempt to uh, add uh, many different uh, parameters to the uh, MI uh, uh, model uh, in order to uh, handle all the use cases that potentially CDNs uh, would need to, to handle. Uh, however, using such a language opens up this uh, domain in order to be able to actually uh, be able to describe a wide variety of uh, uh, actions on on the data, and um, so uh, my my point is really is that it's required for a CDNI type of uh, work, uh, even if it extends wide wider than uh, the charter of the the group. Okay, thank you, uh, Chris. I, I realized as I sat down that I had missed an important point. Um, this language is required in order for different interme intermediaries to process things in a um, uh, in a transportable and interconnected way, right? Like this is part of a, a, a of a protocol agreement between components, and that that really strongly suggests to me that it probably wants to be in a group that is concerned with CDN interconnection. Um, and, and that's where my vote is. Um, Got it. Okay, um, Alan Arlovich. Uh, so I, I want to second the excitement. I think it's very powerful uh, uh, tool and uh, actually there's some discussions we had even to extend it even further. I can see this as being more broadly uh, applicable. I think as, as sort of as a um, expression language may describe uh, proxy caches more broadly than just within CDN uh, context. Uh, but I think here, here and now, I think this is something that we certainly want to build uh, uh, several capabilities on top. And I, I would vote for having this adopted. And potentially, uh, if we can kind of uh, look at broader uh, broader context, and maybe which we'll, I kind of expect this to be, therefore extended beyond those um, uh, core features that have been proposed so far. I think we have been talking right, uh, so far about request response. 
uh, I'll talk later about uh, named footprints. So I think we're we kind of thinking about some extensions uh, to MEL uh, in there as well to include actual endpoint. Uh, but I guess once we take it beyond CDN, will be more extensions. So I think it can be extended. But for this scope, I think this is something that's critical for, for us uh, to pick up and, and, and do what's needed for the charter. Okay. Um, I saw Rajiv in the chat also is in favor of extending the charter if necessary to include this work. Um, and then I see Alfonso in the queue. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, maybe I say I want to say something similar to what other colleagues are, are, has been saying. Um, if, uh, in my point of view, if if it's not in language, this language, we will need any other thing to uh, do what this language is permitting us in the context of the interconnection between an upstream and a downstream CDN. So a way that the upstream is able to um, configure the downstream to do what they want. Uh, to do with the request that the downstream CDN is going to receive. So uh, making, making this uh, expression language uh, generic, uh, not generic, but that could be used in other uh, contexts, uh, I think is shouldn't be a bad thing anyway. Um, but for um, in the people that is working in, in this context of CDNs, it uh, seems uh, pretty uh, good for implementing in our systems. Um, so. Uh, I, I would vote to, to maintain this, uh, this uh, draft or this language in, in this group for that. Okay, thank you, Alfonso. Um, does anyone else have any other comments? I think there's, there's clearly support and enthusiasm for this work. Um, so I think Sanjay and I just need to go back and take a look at how this fits in. Yeah, and the reason I had asked Sanjay to go back to this slide is to show, yes, the language may be, the syntax is, is fairly generic, but these sets of variables and functions are quite specific to the type of HTTP processing that CDNs and open caching systems and CDN interchange uh, aim for. Understood. I think we can then move on to the processing stages one. Okay. You give me that time to move on. Uh, Did, I go back. Too far? Did I go too far? Yeah, a little too far. Back, back. Good. Okay. So building on the work uh, of the expression language uh, is a thing we're calling processing stages. And um, this really is a, meth a mechanism to apply metadata, basically caching rules and access rules um, at the various points of a HTTP request flowing through a CDN. And we define four specific uh, portions in that pipeline that I'll get into in a second of where these things can happen. Typically what, what can happen at any of these stages, like I said, is conditionally applying uh, caching rules. And those conditions of course are expressed through the match expressions that we just looked at. And the other typical thing happening is transforming requests and responses. And so we'll get into some examples of each of these. And the caveat, like the expression language, this is not a programming language. However, it does have some if-else constructs, but those are really uh, structured blocks of metadata. Um, and and not, again, not a full Turing language in any way. Next slide. OK. So the four stages that we're talking about here, and if you can see the, the illustration uh, client on the left or the source of the origin on the right, um, point A, when the request comes in from a client, no surprise there, that's pretty common stuff. Point B, um, if it's a cache miss, a request needs to be forwarded upstream. So that's point B is, is your point to uh, make some alterations uh, before you make a request to uh, upstream. Point C is handling the response coming back from the origin uh, before you put it into cache. And then point D is pulling a response out of cache and serving it to the client. In the case that a cached response is being served, the flow would be A coming from the client and right to D serving it right back. Um, so uh, this client response stage does prevent uh, provide an opportunity to alter responses coming out of cache 
before they go to a client can be very useful in a CDN context. Um, typical things, as I mentioned, that you would do with these flows would be applying specialized policies, transforming headers. Yeah, we already talked about most of this stuff. Um, generating synthetic responses is also another part of this and we'll illustrate some examples. Next slide. Okay, um, again, this is all um, work that we had originally presented a couple of years ago as part of the monster uh, draft that we've caught up in the pieces. Um, so you've seen this model before, it's been refined a little bit in, in, the, uh, in the year or so that's passed. And yeah, all of this does fit in within the uh, generic metadata. Every object you see here is a generic metadata object. Um, effectively, each of those four stages is represented as an object. And each stage has a match group of uh, if rules and then else if rules that can be evaluated uh, cascading in order. And then at each of the stages, the easiest way to think about this is you're either going to apply metadata directly, um, you know, at this stage, set this ACL, that sort of a thing, or set this rule, or you're going to be altering an HTTP request, or you're going to be altering the HTTP response. That's generally all this boils down to. When you're altering requests and responses, typically you're either adding, replacing, or deleting headers. Um, in the response case, when you're altering a response, you might be altering a status code, or you may be generating a complete synthetic response. And uh, we have an example illustrating that. Um, so yeah, like I said, all of this does fit within the um, generic metadata framework. Next. Okay, so here's some examples, uh, something that may be typical to do at the client re request stage. And here we're using um, a MEL expression to uh, evaluate the user agent, in this case, to see if the user agent contains the word mobile in it. And in this, again, somewhat contrived example, we might say, all right, if the request is coming from a mobile device, we're gonna kill it and always return a synthetic response. Um, and the synthetic response in this case, we're able to articulate uh, the headers. So just setting a content type, setting some custom X header that I just made up, setting a status code of a 405, and then using MEL again uh, to synthesize a response body, which is a bunch of text concatenated with the URI that came from the request. So just showing some simple string concatenation here to synthesize a response. Next. Okay, here's an example of uh, use of this within this uh, next stage in the processing where it's been a cache miss and we're forwarding a request onto an origin or an upstream CDN. And then this example, we're adding a couple of headers and deleting a header. This is very common to alter requests before they go onto an origin. So here's a very simple example there. Um, I'll pause just for a second because I see something from Rajiv. Rajiv, you can just go ahead and chime try, try in if you want, Rajiv. Yeah, Rajiv, add, into you, add in, in the queue and then you can uh, speak. Well, let, let him go now or wait. Yeah, you can go now if he wants. Go now, yeah, that's fine. We're in the queue. Go, go ahead, Rajiv. Make sure you unmute yourself. Oh, he's having trouble unmuting. Maybe we'll, we'll let him come in a little bit later. Yeah. All right. You'll get your chance in a moment, Rajiv. So we'll keep going here. Next. You go next slide. There we go. Yep. Okay, another example here we've showed is this origin response stage, you know, getting, a, it was a cache miss, we went to the origin. Uh, by the way, we tend to use the words origin source and upstream CDN sort of all interchangeably in some of these examples, but so it all is intended to mean the same thing. And, and this actually is coupling now the processing stages with the um, cache policy that we, that we reviewed earlier on very common use case here. And this actually also shows the match groups. So there's an if rule and an else if rule. So this sort of demonstrates the whole thing really in context where I'm looking for the origin response. If it's a 200 out of the response, I'm gonna set caching policies one way, and I didn't get into the details here. And then else if it's a 503 or a 504, I'm gonna set caching policies a different way. 
Um, this type of structure we see is very common as people started to use this in the real world. Okay, next. Um, Rajiv? Oh, go ahead, Rajiv. Are you good, Rajiv, with your mic? Yes, I think you should be able to hear me now. Yes. Perfect. Now, I just go wanted ahead. to bring out the um, a point very similar to what Glenn was making, that this then becomes a very powerful place for us to implement, uh, you know, lightweight implementations of other standards. So, um, you know, if we are running a system that supports this kind of open caching, uh, you know, uh, framework, it allows us to implement other standards like uh, trace data, proxy status, or potentially even CMCD and CMSD in a very lightweight way uh, to do both decisioning as well as enrichment of these standards without necessarily having to build uh, new components for the CDN infrastructure. Say, for example, I have an up, I as an upstream CDN, uh, am looking for a very specific type of enriched variable to be added to CMSD as it's going back down to the client. Right. Uh, this allows me to program downstream CDNs to add that enriched variable without having to specifically go to each individual downstream CDN and say, hey, uh, I need you guys to build support for this custom uh, specialized variable in your CMSD or CMCD stacks, right? Yeah, it, it basically gives a lot of control back to uh, the, con the person who's doing the configuration. And this could also be used for, uh, this also makes it capable of us supporting upcoming standards, which may not yet be public now, like streaming media tracing. Uh, I hope Chris is nodding in the room. Uh, but it, it basically means that the lag between a standard coming out and us being able to support it is potentially as short as the amount of time it takes to put a new configuration with a lightweight implementation of that standard together. So, so that, that, that's basically my point here. Um, Thanks, I just added myself in the queue. Um, so I think the maybe what I missed, and maybe we can just go on the mailing list on on the part where I was not quite clear how the CMCD ties into this. Uh, are you thinking of using the uh, uh, expression language to use for CMCD? I couldn't quite get it. You know how that would um, be how the two so, would be tied together. So 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 let's say I as a CDN have um, in my at my origin end. Um, I'm looking for some specific variables, uh, which I'm, I'm I'm taking the standard CMCD and I'm adding a couple of additional variables into that. Um, a typical example for this would be the project that we did in uh, the SVTA around distributed tracing, okay, where we added certain variables, the PMI and Q, uh, you know, CMI, which are now in CMCD v2, they are being proposed to be added as standard variables, right? But in uh, during our testing, we were working on CMCD version 1. It didn't have those variables. So we had to go and modify, uh, say, the players at their end to, uh, you know, uh, extend their CMCD implementation to add these new variables, okay? And we were using that CMCD transport to carry those variables throughout the entire workflow and log them at multiple places so that we could use it as part of our distributed tracing workflow. Now, think of a scenario similar to that, where you're talking of extending by adding additional variables, um, potentially variables with a slightly different type of processing. Say you want to uh, slice and dice your uh, data points in a slightly different way and have it happen at the point where those data points are being populated into those variables. Right. And potentially, uh, you know, compute some derived metrics specific to the hop on which that request is currently flowing through and record that derived variable as an additional parameter in one of these standards. You could do all of that inside the mail and then just tag that parameter on, mod modify the response and send it on its way. And you can do all of this without having the downstream CDN necessarily have to touch or change their CMCD implementation. Uh, 
Yeah, I, I think there's possibilities here to use, you know, because you can append tenders, for example, um, the CMSD, which is still in development with CTA Wave. I could imagine you synthesizing some of the CMSD response headers here, for example, or possibly extracting <laughs> CMCD request headers and doing something interesting with them. So, yeah, I think. And, it's, and it's um, especially, this is very interesting. Uh, also, at the client response stage, especially if you're dealing with things like, uh, you know, requests that are being served from cache, uh, you may want to uh, tweak or modify, say, the CMCD headers that's going downstream to the player for each individual request, which may be different from the original uh, value that you would have recorded at the time of sending out the first request in cache. Uh, if you don't have this ability, basically that value goes to every downstream player. They may be uh, that may be valid for certain parts, but there may be other parameters that you want to be unique per player, okay? Or you want to be specific to the situation at the point where you are, uh, you know, timing it. Like for example, a typical example of this is calculated bandwidth. Now, typically in CMCD, calculated bandwidth is calculated by the player based on its measurement of bandwidth going to its uh, upstream node that's serving it. Uh, if there was a similar parameter in CMSD, it's what bandwidth the upstream node thinks it has in the direction of the player. Now, that would be something that would vary client to client, but would have been recorded in the cache response with uh, the first one. So, I'm, again, this is just me thinking of the top of my head of potential parameters that you may want to change out, um, you know, as you're sending it out. Some of them, if they are part of the base standard, obviously the downstream CDNs or, or cache nodes, uh, CMCD implementation would take care of. But if it's a custom variable or a custom parameter that isn't part of the standard uh, implementation, having the upstream have the ability to configure how that is to be populated is something that I can think of as a use case uh, for this kind of an expression language. Okay. okay, so I think in the interest of time, we'll just move on. Uh, we've got yeah. a few more topics to cover. Yeah, yeah. thanks for, for that, Rajiv. Uh, yeah, next slide, we're pretty much done here. Go to the next slide. Yeah, so you can see how the expression language and the processing stages uh, kind of go together as a pair. I mean, they are independent, uh, but they, uh, the, the main reason for the expression language was to power some of these rich things we saw in the, in the processing stages. Um, yes, yeah, so we feel that, you know, this work is ready. We'd like to see it adopted as a working group draft. I already did notice one stupid thing in processing stages and the title, the word processing has three S's instead of two. So we'll go ahead and fix that next time. Uh, but other than that, um, we'd like to uh, see if this work can be adopted by the uh, working group as a draft. Thanks, Glenn. Uh, I think obviously there there is interest in this at, from, from Rajiv, at least. Um, I think this one is, I have a similar question with respect to, you know, where it fits. I think this one more clearly fits as an intermediary and is, is more potentially CDNI specific, but also could be very generic. Um, so, so we should discuss that in the same, Sunday and I should discuss that in the same um, vein as the, as the Mel, uh, I think, I just want to get a quick show of hands on on folks who support you know this particular piece of work. Um, I haven't used the new show of hands tool. Um, let me see. Yeah, the I hand can... means join queue, right? Where's show of hands? Show oh, of yeah. hands is on the top. Um, I got it. Hold on one sec. Yeah. Um, all right. Did everyone get? a show of hands tool? Yes. OK. And and by default, it, it's a, it uh, defaults to no opinion. So if, if you do have an opinion, uh, either way, just click on it to make sure that your voice is recorded. There has been complaining and commentary on other meetings about that default to no opinion. I think that's going to be changed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, you start out with you know, everybody in the room is no opinion, so. Uh, Okay. Yeah. Um, I'll give it a few more seconds, but it looks like votes are still coming in. Uh, 14 votes for yes, which is pretty good. 
Um, so we'll take that under consideration. Um, Sanjay and I will will discuss the charter, and then I think we can take it to the list um, as well. Unless anyone has any other comments, uh, we are a few minutes behind, so I think we should go ahead and let um, Ben talk about logging extensions. Thanks, Glenn. Thank you. Thanks, Glenn. Okay, so we have logging. All, All right, right ben. thank you. If you want, I can try to pass you the, the um, if you wanted to slide, drive the slide. Oh, it's only a couple of slides. So okay. I think it's like, it's like four slides. So it shouldn't be that big of a deal. Um, if we could just go to the first slide. Yep. Okay. So logging. We already have uh, some logging defined as part of CDNI with 7937. Um, it has a very specific format with a set list of data fields and atom-based index. Doesn't really tell you how to retrieve any of this stuff. It just defines the formats. Um, it's been around for a while, but it has proven to be insufficient to meet the needs of CDN operators. Um, so as part of some work in the SVTA, we did a requirement survey from uh, across a, a fair number of companies, including upstream content originators, uh, CDN providers, and vendors of CDN software to determine what are the current requirements in the industry for CDN logging. Um, as part of that uh, survey, we identified uh, the needs to support different log formats, a bunch of a pretty long list of different data fields and uh, modern transport mechanisms. So it was insufficient just to specify the formats. We also need the ability to advertise and to configure on the upstream to downstream side how those logs are delivered, um, both pulled by the, uh, by the upstream from the downstream and pushed to the upstream from the downstream. Uh, we, you know, we need bi-directional support for transport mechanisms. Uh, in addition to all of that, we also need the ability to comply with uh, my, modern privacy legislation and regulations. Uh, so we require the ability to obfuscate certain log fields that contain personally identifiable information, uh, in addition to other values that may be sensitive for other reasons. Uh, can we go to the next slide? So as part of this work and putting this whole draft together, and it was uh, quite a long effort, you know, over a year of work, um, we've defined first at the high level, a number of different file formats. So no longer are we limited to that uh, ELF derivative. We can now support JSON, white space delimited, protobuf, and importantly, we can also support transmission of tarballs that contain multiple log files. And alongside those log files, we can also have metadata. So you can have a JSON file that lives alongside a log file of any format so you could have a uh, you know a new line delimited log file with CSV log log records uh, without any headers, and you can have a file that lives alongside that that contains all of the metadata about that file. For instance, the uh, time range when that file uh, you know that that log file covers um, any particular transformation operations that were applied against fields in that file, references to uh, external services that contain encryption keys for fields in that file and that sort of thing. And that's completely separate from the log file itself, um, though it can be embedded in the case of uh, the JSON container. We also uh, specify a laundry list of log fields. So the field definitions from 7937 were insufficient 
the this draft specifies uh, a list of fields. Some of them uh, are holdovers from 7937. Many of them are new. Uh, the definitions are all, uh, for the most part, new. Uh, and then those are organized into different record sets. So the draft currently defines a minimal standard and extended set. The minimal set is kind of focused on the uh, the smallest uh, file size. So something like a billing use case where you don't need all of the extra data that uh, the standard format gives you. And then we also have the extended format, which includes basically every field. So it's exhaustive. Um, once you have all of your, your records in a file, um, you might also want to uh, apply those transformation operations I just talked about. So this works both ways. The downstream can specify uh, a, a sequence of operations that have been applied to fields. So for instance, uh, the downstream might truncate network addresses and uh, there's no option for the upstream to receive the full network address of the client. Uh, that would be part of the advertisement. On the other side, uh, the upstream might want to configure the logs that are received from the downstream with certain operations applied. Uh, for instance, encrypting sensitive data that should only be visible to certain parties. So these work both ways. Uh, the downstream can optionally support uh, those mechanisms, so it's not not required. Pretty much all of this can be optionally supported inside of the advertisement. Uh, and then we have a number of mechanisms for shipping the logs. So this draft defines support for S3, SFTP, uh, and Kafka uh, alongside the legacy mechanism uh, of that atom-based index, which now also in this draft has a uh, built-in discovery mechanism that's part of the advertisement to, uh, to advertise the endpoint for where to actually retrieve those log files. Uh, so if we go to the next slide, there's just an example here of what the logging metadata looks like. So in this example, the upstream is uh, transmitting configuration to the downstream to tell it to ship logs to a particular S3 bucket uh, name the with the file names in a certain format um, using a defined record type. So those that record type string corresponds to a combination of a format and a record set. Um, so there is a there is a small error in this current draft, which I'll just point out right now, which is that some of those those record type strings have uh, incorrect names. They they have an open caching identifier that's part of those that should not be part of that draft. So that'll get corrected. Uh, the other thing we see here in this example is use of MI secret value. So that access key secret property is an MI secret value object that contains a reference to a defined secret store with the path to retrieve the secret from that external store. Um, so that, that's a use case for that protected secrets metadata draft. Um, can we go to the next slide? So despite all the work that went into this, uh, you know, as I said, it was a lengthy effort. We couldn't, we couldn't cover everything. So we've, we've kind of put in all the stuff we could get done, which is sufficient to cover some very common use cases, uh, you know, and fills, fills a very big gap in the, uh, the set of CDNI configuration. But there's still a lot of work to do. So the biggest thing is supporting custom definitions for formats and fields, uh, and particularly derived fields. So you might have, for instance, um, geolocation fields derived from IP address or uh, operating system field derived from user agent, that type of thing. Uh, so those, you know, all of that is not in the current draft everything you see on the slide here, but that's stuff that's being worked on. So it might be uh, you know, a future version of this draft, depending on when that comes versus when this, how this draft moves along in the working group, or it could be separate drafts that extend the functionality here in the same way this draft extends the functionality of 7937.
Um, so uh, I'll kind of pause there because that's th that that's the explanation. Um, I don't know if anyone has any questions about this draft. If anyone's actually given it a read through yet, uh, I know it, it's quite large and got posted at the last minute, um, right at the deadline here. Rajiv, go ahead. Yeah, I, I just wanted to chime in with uh, support for the draft and also saying that as you know, these standards become more and more widely adopted and more and more CDNs and operators, uh, you know, um, and small cash providers start getting interconnected, uh, you are going to have a need to have uh, more automated transfer of all such data. Uh, uh, most of it in today's standards would require a lot more manual coordination between the parties. And um, in my opinion, the biggest reason to have this significantly automated is for billing. Because um, eventually you want an environment where people can use spare capacity and other CDNs and charge for uh, you know the actual traffic that they deliver. And uh, doing any sort of billing like that is going to be impossible unless there is an exchange of data on what was actually delivered. I yeah, and, and I'll and I'll say that uh, Rajiv, that the that'll happen anyway. So you know, if this draft didn't exist, then uh, the problem is if this all of this work exist. still needs to happen anyway. It would just happen outside the context of no. If, uh, if this draft did, didn't exist, um, every. Uh, pair of parties would basically find their own solution to it. Exactly. Yeah. There would be a proprietary mechanism yes. for, for all of the participants. Right. Right. Okay. Um, I'm going to throw up another poll really quickly just to see who has read this draft. I have not had a chance to read the draft yet. Um, I apologize. Um, I think I guess, Ben, so your, your proposal is take the draft as is. Um, there will be either additions to it as it moves along through the working group or possibly, you know, new stuff that will come. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I guess it depends on the timeline as, you know, a, and what the response is from people who want to contribute here on the CDNI side. Because um, work is, con is continuing with a group on the SVTA that is building this draft. And that's gonna that's gonna continue. So uh, w whether you know w if if this one you know if we if this moves along, then you know maybe that that future work will just be additional drafts. Um, if there's lots of contribution happening on this side as well, then uh, you know we'll have to we'll, we'll have to merge it together and figure something out, I guess. Um, okay. Yeah, I, I guess I guess let's see is my is my response to, to your to your question. Um, no, no, understood. I mean, I think I, it's good. This is the first step. Let's present it here. See who's exactly, interested. Yeah. See how much um, interest we get. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, and I'll close the poll. It's about half and half. There's a half dozen people have read it. Um, so I, I encourage folks to go and read the draft. I will also go and read the draft. I think the the issues raised that you raised, Ben, are, are important ones, and and you know, the the original specification does lack certain capabilities, which which uh, which understandably we need. Yeah, I'm 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 happy to answer any questions that anyone has, um, whether you want to ask publicly on the mailing list or if you just want private clarification. I'm I'm happy to make myself available to help you understand uh, anything regarding this draft, whether motivation or implementation. Yeah, and I, I would encourage that those you know uh, discussions happen in the mailing list because I think it, it'll be useful um, if there are questions that people are asking. Um, that'll also help us understand that, you know, what's the interest. All right, thank you, Ben. Thank you, Ben. All right, so I think this brings us to the open mic session. And we've got a couple of items here. 
Uh, you can come up here too. Nope. Yeah. So I think I need to load. I have the name for okay. It's it's all together, right? Yes. Okay. One. Well. All right. Uh, floor right. is all yours. Uh, yeah. So um, uh, this is kind of a brief introduction of um, cache management interface effort. Uh, that uh, we've been uh, working on at uh, SVTA for last, I would say, 18 months now, maybe more. Um, so I want to introduce the concept and uh, also talk about uh, plans for bringing uh, this effort to um, CDNI. So uh, the kind of cache management is sort of uh, an obvious topic and there was uh, some some history kind of within cdni literature and svta actually to try and um, define this uh, what we find now that we lacking kind of uh, practical uh, definition of uh, uh, just industry standard interface for standard cache management operations that wouldn't enable upstream CDNs to uh, do content prepositioning, uh, invalidation and purge of content. Um, the, the kind of benefit is clear is what is mostly now in the industry is sort of manual or semi-manual process. So uh, having such interface would uh, facilitate automation. And I think also benefit to, uh, any automation would uh, certainly as a result benefit uh, scale. So more integrations uh, would be possible in the ecosystem with automated uh, interface like that. Uh, the goal is kind of certainly to support uh, multi-CDN environment. So that means that multiple DCDNs talking to multiple UCDNs. Um, and uh, also um, we want to uh, kind of win in the effort to span basically all types of CDNs, even though kind of the, the effort is primarily driven by open caching CDNs, but the goal is kind of to uh, publish something would be industry broad and would apply to public CDNs as well, um, allowing sort of common interface to cover uh, all types of CDN um, in the ecosystem today. Uh, so that's kind of first and foremost. Uh, second second uh, uh, driver is um, I think we're looking at use cases where we have uh, uh, regional, regionalized CDNs. So to enable uh, kind of uh, UCDNs to manage content across multiple regions, uh, place content and manage cache. So imagine DCDN that has uh, multiple kind of sub geographies that it manages on the, on the common umbrella. Uh, like the next motivation use case we, 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 we cover is uh, uh, performance optimization. So where UCDN would share some uh, cache object uh, information that would enable DCDN to enhance its, ca its uh, caching efficiency. So it's something that we call cache hints, where basically a way to transmit uh, information about object without necessarily transmitting object itself. And cache management seems like a good, good vehicle and uh, framework to do that. And last uh, but not least, uh, looking at uh, highly distributed CDNs with edge storage and limited storage capacity. So within cache management, there's uh, special support that's needed for uh, quota management, so uh, ability to uh, define kind of and manage limited uh, limited storage, and also a use case for catalog replication. So it's kind of as opposed to let's say traditional and mainstream uh, kind of proxy cache, uh, also an ability to replicate catalog of objects uh, to the edge. So th that's sort of why. Uh, next slide. Uh, yes. okay. I just do it here. Yeah. Uh, so uh, high-level uh, interface architecture. So um, uh, DCDN on the left, kind of um, multitude of cache nodes. We have an interface, sort of uh, common interface managing uh, all them cache nodes and UCDN on the right. And uh, we envision kind of two types of APIs being exposed. Uh, one is trigger-based uh, trigger based API and um, Kind of, uh, we are heavily reliant on CDNI trigger v2 effort, which was really uh, met the bill for everything we we're looking for. So, uh, and this is the main API what we see here is kind of adopting uh, CITV2 um, API, which is essentially is operations API. So, an API which enables UCDN 
to ask the CDN to execute asynchronous operation on its behalf and, and get results asynchronously. So the key uh, operations, preposition, invalidate, and merge would happen through triggers. Uh, additionally, we we uh, adding additional uh, one more API, which is Cache Bucket API, uh, which is the API to enable kind of uh, cache virtualization. So we adding a concept of Cache Bucket, which is the next slide, um, and uh, the concept is basically to enable DCDN, uh, UCDN actually to allocate to this API sort of cache subsets or containers of cache objects, and then uh, match uh, configuration uh, to those cache objects. And that can be by sort of a, a config subsection. So I can see specific um, uh, pattern match being uh, matched to, let's say, to uh, store images in a separate uh, set of content. And I can uh, manage uh, storage quota for that separately. So that's one kind of doing that by, I think, uh, content type is one use case. Another is uh, footprint um, aware uh, buckets. So where I can allocate uh, for same even uh, path match or pattern match, I can allocate and match different cache objects, cache buckets, uh, depending on the geography. And I can therefore manage preposition, -pre version, validate, and cache uh, within different DCD and footprints uh, separately this way. So that's kind of, this kind of at high level, this is, um, uh, this is virtualization capability, right? So I can, instead of talking about one monolithic cache, we're now talking about variety of cache stores or cache buckets within DCDN that can be managed by, um, uh, by UCDN. Kind of the trigger API comes in the concept of a bucket. So we're not changing the trigger API in any way, just that in the naming convention, we're attaching this to a particular bucket. Like when I want to proposition objects or purge, I will need to specify which bucket I'm referring to within the URL. Uh, the trigger, uh, trigger API itself uh, is, is stays the same. Uh, we're exposing a, a new API that enables to uh, UCDN to allocate query, basically query, uh, delete, update those buckets. And then uh, uh, within uh, configuration, we can attach a my objects uh, to to uh, to cache buckets, so assigning separate uh, subsections of uh, uh, of configuration to uh, these uh, cache bucket uh, objects. Um, next slide. Uh, so, uh, kind of when I'm looking at kind of just list of features, so what cache management interface as a spec uh, uh, in introduces. So. Um, uh, there's some, so again, uh, taking on and really uh, working uh, heavily with CATV2 uh, spec. Um, uh, so extensions in there that we're looking to do is kind of introducing uh, kind of non-playlist uh, object lists. So right now CAT speaks about um, HLS, HSS, and Dash. So ability to specify uh, a list of files through sort of media-based uh, formats. Uh, we want to add other formats, so just ability to add a list of objects that is in plain text or JSON. So we're introducing two new uh, two new types uh, for propositioning. Uh, uh, several uh, policies that we want to add. So one is a preposition a policy. Everything that has to do with propositioning, bandwidth, concurrency, this list of I think ten to twelve properties we have around propositioning. How propositioning can be done. Um, uh, and purge. So how do you actually interpret purge uh, triggers? So that's got two extension policies. Again, uh, meet very nicely with the uh, extension mechanism and framework built into V2. That's great. Um, third is scheduling. So I think that sort of a bit overlaps with time policy that is in V2 right now. So we have some discussion whether this could, should be a separate extension or the same extension, but kind of... Uh, taking time policy kind of and extending this using iCalendar, uh, providing more tools for UCDN to schedule those operations. Like, hey, I want to do this kind of every Sunday. I want to do this, uh, but and until like end of the year uh, or per should be complete until then this time zone. So iCalendar provides kind of powerful capability there that kind of uh, goes beyond uh, what available in V2 now. Kind of, again, question is, it, is it kind of an extension or addition to existing policy or a new one? 
uh, other than that, it's clearly uh, an extension. Uh, uh, two more things, right? So uh, with introduction of playlists, we feel that uh, triggers become easy to use, but also uh, easy to break. So when you provide a manifest or a list of manifests, and when you kind of, you need to provide back uh, more, more information about the handling, like, okay, you gave me a manifest to UCDN, I DCDN downloaded that, and this is the objects I have derived from it. So we are in agreement, uh, what is success? Because when, when it was explicit listing, it was easy to see, this is a list that I was successful or I failed with manifest as a sort of indirect. So we adding, uh, proposing to add uh, basically a list of optional uh, object lists in the statues. Like I succeeded and this is the objects I purged or I succeeded and this is the objects I prepositioned. Uh, and if I failed with some of them, here is what happened and why. So kind of uh, basically more robust support for uh, playlist or object list operations with triggers. Um, we also want to uh, work with content category this is something that was existing in CDNI literature for a while, not really used because we didn't have really cache management uh, effort. Uh, there is a kind of a subject uh, in uh, trigger a subject in, in the spec, going back to the original RFC that allay, uh, allows operations to be applied to different uh, basically tags, right? And the mechanism there is there to uh, create tags for objects in the configuration. Like all objects that are uh, matched under certain configuration subsection can be ma matched with static tag uh, called MI grouping. Uh, we want to actually do more, and I'll talk about it next, and, uh, by, and work with tags uh, in the triggers. So if objects are tagged in more ways now that I want to purge, for example, a specific asset or a specific uh, quality, um, I can use uh, this uh, uh, CCID uh, as a vehicle. Again, existing mechanism, ju just using it more uh, with object tagging. Uh, cache buckets, I just, I think, talked about it. So, so we want to have ability to uh, manage specific kind of cache subsets instead of just one monolithic cache within DCDN. Um, so uh, two more so going on. Object tagging. Uh, object tagging is a very important feature. So a kind of reality of cache management is that you actually manage a lot of objects. So you, what you don't want to do, I think, is just uh, rely, uh, rely on URL lists or regular expressions. It's not very uh, scalable. And what industry has been doing is actually implementing tagging in, in private integrations uh, where uh, upstream CDN uh, tags objects using uh, a header uh, so sur a surrogate key is, is, is what, what's been sort of used. Uh, we want to adopt this mechanism and to allow UCDN to communicate to, to DCDN and say, hey, uh, I'm going to send you objects uh, kind of in the proxy chain or in proposition, and I'm going to have these response headers, and you want to look at those response headers and use the values of those headers as tags. And you can have multiple tags. So for example, I can take uh, a manifest, so let's say I have a collection of files and I, have to, I can tag it, tag it as video, I can tag it with asset ID, I can tag it with uh, specific uh, file types within the manifest. Uh, let's say here, that's a manifest and all the manifests, there's subtitle and there's a segments and just provide very, very kind of elaborate tagging. And the way to do this that we propose is having a, a new object that kind of extends MI grouping. So hence the name MI grouping extended, which will enable static tagging and enable this kind of use of header. So I can use a header and this header can be a standard one or specific headers that uh, DCD and UCDN agree on. And this will be kind of basically a metadata object uh, for that. Um, similar concept uh, for priority. So if we want UCDN transmitting to DCN some information about object priority and saying, hey, you want this object that's popular, you want to, to retain it and maybe don't purge it because maybe you don't see it, but it's gonna be popular or the other way around, here's an object that I think is trash, don't even bother caching that. So uh, same mechanism, uh, provide a header that uh, will be configured and that header will communicate uh, priority from UCDN to DCN. Uh, Cache hint, uh, I mentioned it before, 
So a mechanism for uh, DCDN to pull down or receive information about an object without actually downloading that. So uh, the spec uh, prepositions uh, policy will enable, will actually specify what uh, methods can be used to retrieve an object. And if UCDN allows a head method for the object is essentially a way for DCDN to pull down uh, kind of the information about the, the object size and these custom fields, including priority, without actually pulling down the body. And then uh, DCDN may decide later if they want to have this object based on information it received or just, uh, or not. So cache hint is a mechanism that, that uh, using head or options HTTP method that uh, uh, we are specifying. Um, and uh, last on the list is uh, reuse of configuration metadata. Very valuable configuration objects that are uh, kind of used and are defined in the configuration interface. Uh, specifically, uh, this is uh, 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 origin access information. So we don't want to respecify that again. Uh, in the triggers. So when UCDN comes and asks UCDN to preposition stuff, it um, uh, it may say, well, hey, you have these objects I already gave you about how to access my origin, please use them. So we, we are kind of uh, basically uh, having a way to, to uh, pull that in. Uh, so, uh, and how, so how do we want to bring it in, right? So there, we, we see right now, three, maybe even four documents here. So one is that I think the core specs, uh, we want to kind of, uh, and that's a discussion that Sanjay mentioned to have added to the core draft, which is not an extension, but kind of core capabilities. And there is an argument what specifically will make it, but that's kind of my wish list, and we'll see what makes it out of this discussion. So the, which I think are core, core features. Then we'll have a separate draft. We'll have the, the, uh, the extension policies on top of those that are specced in the core draft adding. Looks like scheduling recurrence, proposition, and purge will be three more additional extensions. Um, and uh, third is basic cache management, uh, into kind of cache management uh, metadata and API. And I see maybe the cache bucket actually makes it in its, its own uh, draft. It's, it's, I think it's, it's possible that it'll be kind of separate because it says it's a, a, an object and API on top of that. And separately, we'll have MI grouping and MI cache priority. So that, that's the current plan. And kind of, we'll, we'll see how we make it uh, kind of uh, make it roll. And I think the uh, core draft is something that uh, we want to address now. Uh, questions, comments? Go ahead, Chris. Chris, Chris Lewin's Comcast. Um, are you familiar with the um, uh, cache groups and cache invalidation APIs uh, work that has been presented in the HTTP BIS working group? Uh, I'm not familiar. What is it about? It's a cache invalidation and purge API, um, along with some tags that help you figure out when one when one object. Uh, uh, th that's the validation one. The cache groups one uh, is some tags that help you invalidate or revalidate objects as a group. And the overlap here is significant and non-trivial. And it makes me wonder if we're defining something that is for CDN interconnection or if it's just for management of a CDN in general, um, particularly since the HTTP BIS working group is... Uh, looking at things that are very, very, very similar. So that would be, I think, individual cache management, right? So kind of ability to... to... No. So, so the API there is, is um, a way for... Uh, it's two pieces. There's a discovery, discoverability component so that um, you can figure out where the, um, where the cache is, but also or where, the, where the API endpoints are, but also a mechanism by which you can uh, uh, make an API call in a particular format and tell an entire CDN to do whatever CDN magic it needs to do in order to invalidate or purge this particular URI. Right, so I, I would think that that the, you know, without looking at the body work, I think the 
actually the it's not a question actually to our effort. I think it's a question to CDNI with CI two v two effort because CI two actually talks about invalidation and purge. So right. I think that's something that I think we need to kind of probably address right away. So see yeah. what kind we, of we because probably figure out how to harmonize that work. Yeah, sort of because what we are doing really falls out of like taking on CA two v draft and extending that right. So I kind of um, so I think that there's that's uh, uh, coordination needs to happen. Yeah. Um, so that's yeah, a we'll uh, for the check it out. Yeah. Um, I think Kevin is yeah. on the queue as well. Yeah, thanks, Chris, for bringing that up. Um, we should definitely look into it. I, I had one quick clarifying question with respect to cash buckets and and the grouping. Um, are is there something that is infeasible by using URI pattern matching, or is it just that URI pattern matching is too cumbersome and that the grouping mechanism is um, more efficient? Um... URI pattern matching is potentially not even feasible. I think that I'll, I'll give just one use case. And again, that's actually been practiced in the industry already. So it's not me. Uh, my opinion is that if you're looking at uh, groups that are actually don't have a common URI pattern, right? That's, uh, uh, or kind of there's no easy overlap. So a great example, I think, with video is uh, basically manifest all the files that goes into manifest or even more complex manifest plus associated files and so you have video and then chunks and then you have subtitles and you have the thumbnails right so you don't have necessarily an easy uh way of actually combining them into any uri regular expression or or pattern match um that's first uh and you're kind of so i would say both and actually uh, uh tagging that enables uh upstream to actually uh, create tags that are connected to actual internal workflow. It makes automation so much easier. So you can actually emit a lot of tags when you produce content and you publish, you can emit those tags automatically and then you want therefore to use them for any cache operation. Like if, for example, uh, I want to basically delete particular video asset, right? I can kind of- I, I think, I can, I think okay. in, in, the, in the interest of time, we probably have to move quickly because you have about a minute left, minute and a half to present your uh, next yeah. slide. And so I think, uh, unfortunately, questions that you have comments, please put them in the mailing list. That's a great place for us to make sure that, you know, communications continues. Yeah, I'm happy to pick it up there. Uh, so uh, name footprints, kind of, it's, it's a second go. Uh, I think, again, motivation didn't change. I presented this before. Uh, we need advanced footprint capabilities. I think actually I have new efforts I see in SVT emerging like multicast. We kind of want to use it. So we think that there's uh, significant support, I think, for this. Um, um, so um, so the, the draft we had submitted expired, right? So the, is yeah. there anything, is there, what is the key message you want to convey? Yeah, so uh, a minute. Next, next slide. So uh, kind of, I, I don't think it was really picked up. And I think Kevin, you, you voiced some, some, uh, uh, opposition to this. So what changed from since our initial draft to that there's some misc uh, syntax fixes that near, uh, near proposed. And if you looked at that, I think you're overall supportive of this. We want to add also instead of, in addition to pull also push. So DCDN can actually push uh, updates and footprints for dynamic footprints. And we also want to support a new uh, actually RFC that uh, allow DCDN to self publish its own geo information for its own uh, its own um, uh, uh, footprint. Um, I think the opposition, or I want to clarify an important point, I think there was a discussion about is it in Charter, and I'm hearing Charter maybe not the big issue, but I think Alto is a big, big thing. So Alto is not named footprints, and I want to really stress it. Alto is a way for uh, access provider to publish its topology and cost and so on to facilitate request routing happening on a network. It can be uh, CDN driven, like a multi CDN client steering, uh, or can be peer to peer. But this is access provider talking to endpoints that are already have established that they live on that network and want to be network optimal. Name from footprints is the flip, is actually you have a UCDN uh, trying to figure out which DCDN it can use and may have potential multiple candidates. And name footprints is a mechanism to publish those coverage footprints. Uh, enabling a UCD and then associate specific customers uh, with it. And then potentially using Alto later. Like if once I have selected, oh, I want to work with this DCDN, I can maybe go then and query the, the associated Alto if that's available, but name footprint comes come before. 
So I so, think that, that's there's no overlap. Yeah. So I, so I suggest that maybe you you resubmit version one and then we'll um, uh, have an opportunity to take a look at it and then you know have some discussions in the, in the mailing list. So uh, I think we're almost up at the time. So let me uh, give a uh, microphone to uh, Kevin and then if there's any time remaining, I'll, I'll chime in. Uh, yeah, 10 seconds. Thanks everybody. Again, I'll, as always, please go and read the drafts. Please post your comments to the list. Um, Sanjay and I will um, look at the, the adoption requests for the new drafts and otherwise, um, thanks for coming, safe travels, and we'll see you guys and everyone all at the next IETF. Sanjay. Yes, uh, thanks everybody. And please, please review the drafts and put your comments on the mailing list. Thank you, everybody. Bye, everyone. Take care. Bye bye. Yes, I've got to see it.